Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Hey, you there in Liverpool. Thanks so much for this Max graffiti. You can now see on your screen. I asked people around the world to put Max graffiti up in your city. Liverpool, thank you. This has got to be five or six cities now around the world that have huge Max portrait graffiti. Yes! Okay, now, the Lilliputians, let's talk about them. They looked upon fraud as a greater crime than theft. For, with care and vigilance, one could protect your property from theft, but where fraud is permitted or conceived or connived or hath no law to punish, the honest dealer is always undone, and the knave gets the advantage. Just look at America and or the UK, and you will see the Lilliputians had a point, for the knaves do indeed have all the advantage. Doth thyest agreeeth with me, O knave whisperer, <laughs> Stacy Herbert. Well, indeed, I do believe there are many knaves that rule the world, especially here in the UK and in the US. And there is no knave more knave-like than Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan. And he's oh, <laughs> Jamie Dimon of Jamie. He, he's a gift that keeps on giving, like herpes or AIDS or something. He's, he's financial herpes. Wherever he goes, people are infected with his, his, his banking um, virus. Well, he's also, I would say, a Lilliputian and a Bigendian. So uh, we've got them all rolled up into one. McCain pressures justice to hold J.P. Morgan executives accountable. Um, as we know, J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon went to meet with Eric Holder in person uh, on the 26th of September. And in response, Senator McCain sent this letter. He said, will you seek to hold any top officer, director, or key employees within J.P. Morgan personally accountable for the wrongdoing? McCain of Arizona wrote in a letter today to Attorney General Eric Holder. McCain, the ranking Republican on a Senate subcommittee that probed J.P. Morgan's record trading loss last year, criticized Holder's September 26th meeting with Chief Executive Officer Jamie Dimon, calling it highly unusual. Now, the meeting was regarding the uh, alleged $11 billion fine that, he, that he's going to pay on behalf of J.P. Morgan for uh, mortgage fraud. Well, kudos to John McCain. I take back all those nasty <laughs> things I said about him for warmongering and always talking about bombing Iran. I would tweet often and saying, Dear Vietnam, please take John McCain back and put him back into the uh, prisoner of war camp because he seems to like that sort of thing. But I take that all back now. And he seems to be standing up to the banksters uh, and writing a letter to Eric Holder. Unfortunately, Eric Holder, like Gary Gensler of the CFTC or the SEC or all these other regulators, are in the pocket of Jamie Dimon. So I'm afraid that will end up for naught. But as the Lilliputians said, you know, it was fraud that was the more the bigger danger to your economy because it drives out the good, the good business person, the person trying to do an honest living. Whereas if the knave is able to commit fraud after fraud after fraud after fraud after fraud after fraud and then go to the Justice Department for a personal meeting, Lord knows it could have been a Bandar Blair sort of situation. Was he threatening him? Who knows what happened or transpired in that meeting? Now, John McCain said, your personal meeting with the CEO of the corporate target of a major criminal investigation at the request of the CEO while negotiations on a global settlement agreement are pending is highly unusual and under the circumstances that meeting occurred gives rise to concern. Oh yeah, well, I mean, the criminogenic nature mm -hmm. of business in America as William K. Black would describe it, former prosecutor who put a lot of bankers in jail after the savings and loan crisis. Mm. This has become the day-to-day -day grist of the American economy. And the CNBC folks, of course, they are in denial. They don't think Jamie Dimon has committed massive crimes and committed massive fraud or, or uh, Lloyd Blank firing over there at Goldman Sachs. But of course they have. It's been documented. They've paid plenty of fines for it. I mean, had there not been laws changed after the savings and loan crisis decriminalizing the fraud that Jamie Dimon's involved with today, he, like the bankers of that era, would be in jail. Remember, one, mm. of the, one of the fallouts from the SNL crisis was bankers changed the law to make the crimes of the SNL era legal. They decriminalized Ponzi schemes uh, and they decriminalized uh, banking terrorism is now a, a perfectly acceptable way to make money in America now. And Dimon, under those set of laws, would be sitting right next to Bernie Madoff. But Lo and behold, Eric Holder and the whole Washington establishment, who takes money from the extortionist on Wall Street, changed the law to make 
criminal, criminal behavior that was once worthy of a prison sentence and maybe a hanging, now it's okay. Well, uh, first of all, I have redubbed Ponzi scheme. It's now called an Osborne scheme in the world of financial uh, Twitterists. <laughs> <laughs> so the Osborne scheme, and I think we should also note for people exactly where we're getting this reference to Lilliputians. Are we talking about Gulliver's Travels here? Yes, those Jonathan Lilli Swift, 1726. Those Lilliputians. Those Lilliputians. Okay, <laughs> they, they seem to be quite wise for Lilliputians. <laughs> well, now, okay, we're talking about a criminogenic environment where fraud and knaves thrive. So how does that happen? How does it happen aside from just the elite circles? How do the masses of the population accept that only small time crooks, the, the guys rioting here in the UK a few summers ago, how do, why is it that we all accept that they should be sent to prison for months on end, whereas Jamie Dimon should be able to go down to the Department of Justice and meet with the Attorney General of the United States and decide whether or not he should be fined for anything or face any punishment? Well, part of it is the media and the propaganda. And that takes us to this headline, the J.P. Morgan Apologists of CNBC. So I'm going to show you this little clip. And it's Maria Baratiroma of CNBC. And she questions Alex Perrine of Huffington Post. So should we talk about the financial strength of J.P. Morgan uh, at this point? I mean, even with all of these losses, the company continues to churn out you know, tens of billions of dollars in earnings and hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue. Um, how do you criticize that? Uh, I, well, I think a lot of their earnings and revenue we've seen have come from really shady dealings that they've been... Oh, come on. They have. Right. Name, <laughs> name three shady dealings. Well, it, it's a uh, mentality of entitlement. It's a, plan, it's a plantation mentality. And it's funny how politics in America is now breaking along racial lines. Here you have Jamie Dimon from the big house visiting Eric Holder down there in the field doing the field work. And he's lecturing him about his place. And Eric Holder needs to find his place on the plantation. And Barack Obama needs to find his place on Jamie Dimon's plantation. And Maria Bartiromo is like one of those southern bells. Oh, 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 uh, Atlanta's burning. Oh, what should I do? So going back to the story about Jamie Dimon and J.P. Morgan, and she had asked Alex Perrine, what have they done wrong? What, they're making profits. What crimes have they committed? What have they done that's wrong? So I'll name three. She said, name three of them. Well, Jefferson County, Alabama, where two J.P. Morgan bankers paid bribes to public officials in Jefferson County, Alabama. The, the public officials are now in jail. J.P. Morgan executives, not in jail. They paid a fine for the bogus credit default swaps attached to this Bond. That's two. Number that's, two. That's, that's just, number one. That's just number still one. one. Number two, energy market rigging in California. And number three, LIBOR rigging. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the government-backed agencies, are now suing Jamie Dimon's JP Morgan because of rigging global interest rates on the 300 plus trillion dollar market. No, yeah, that's just three. There's LIBOR, there's AIG, there's Madoff, all Jamie uh, Dimon and JP Morgan all had a hand in it. There's a violation of minimum capital requirements. They break 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's regulatory capture. The list goes on and on and on. He's got a rap sheet longer than Tony Soprano. But again, <laughs> he's white. So therefore, in today's America, that means he's right. Well, Eric Holder is very black, and I think he is allowed to get away with crimes. I don't think it's a matter of any sort of race. I think oh, well, that, a, that's right. A, but he got a lecture too, didn't he? Because yeah. he was uh, getting out of his place. So they had to send Jamie Dimon, the big white father from Wall Street, to t you know tell Eric Holder, get in your place. Okay, okay so this we, is what's going on. <laughs> so we that's what's going metaphors. on. We have many metaphors in this episode, but we're going to go. You started it with the Lilliputians, okay? <laughs> Who would have put a Lilliputian in the teleprompter? I don't know. There it was. Here we are now. There you have it. Max just reads the teleprompter. I write the words. <laughs> Nobody doubts that. So the other point made here was that profits, they wash away all sins. Well, Felix Salmon in Reuters says, besides, banks shouldn't be obscenely profitable. They're intermediaries. And in an efficient economy, their profits should be quite easily competed away. 
when bank profits are high, that's a sign that the bank in question is extracting rents from the economy rather than helping it to grow. So here we have it, a situation where, as you said in the top of the show, the Lilliputians thought that fraud was bad because it allows the knaves to flourish. And here we have the prime example that profits are rising in the banking sector because the knaves are allowed to scoop and take and steal and defraud and steal and take and defraud. Well, I'm sticking with my plantation metaphor because to justify slavery in the South was this notion that it's highly profitable. It's profitable, Jamie Dimon says, with his fraud that he commits daily, so therefore it's righteous. And Maria uh, uh, Martirovo Balatashnako, baloney face, whatever her name is, she is proponing, a proponent of this idea of um, noblesse oblige, essentially, that Jamie Dimon is an aristocrat, he knows what's best for America, he knows what's best for the world, just give him the benefit of the doubt, he's above the law, if you don't like it, then get down there and start picking cotton. So, and then finally on this Felix Salmon piece, he um, also mentions that she wipes away all, the fact that he was going down there to meet with Eric Holder was regarding the mortgage fraud, the mortgage fraud that has destroyed the mortgage market in America. Uh, almost 100% of all mortgages written now are backed by the U.S. government because there is no private sector. So he says the country was seriously damaged by J.P. Morgan's lies and misrepresentations about its mortgages, much more than it would be damaged if the share price went down instead of up. And the public has every reason to want the individuals running J.P. Morgan to be held accountable when it gets into serious regulatory trouble over and over again. Right, and remember that when the crisis hit in 2008 and the bank's profits were completely obliterated because they were over leveraged and made horrible bets, then this notion that, well, they were making money, they're righteous, so to restore this righteousness, we're going to give them a huge multi trillion dollar bailout to restore this thing called market fundamentalism, the ideology of profits over people, the ideology of profits over humanity, which is exactly the same thinking that motivates people to strap on suicide bombs and go into cafes and blow them themselves up. Here, Jamie Dimon is strapping on debt, and he's a suicide banker, and Maria Mar Bartiromo is justifying market fundamentalism and market terrorism. Thanks, Maria. Great job. Okay, Stacey Hilbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Stay tuned for the second half. A whole lot more. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Mark Armstrong of publicbanking.org. Or, Mark, welcome to the Kaiser Report. Hey, Max, good to be here. All right, Mark Armstrong, let's talk first about the banking system as we currently know it. First, the FDIC, it protects our deposits, right? It is insurance for protecting our deposits, but the insurance fund is only about $26, $27 billion. Deposits are way over a trillion dollars. So in light of the derivatives bubble, which goes up to about 10, 10 plus trillion just for at risk, just for B of A and, and uh, Chase, uh, there's, there could be a real problem. In, All right, let's get, we'll get to derivatives in a second, but let's just revisit those numbers for a second. You're saying there's a roughly a trillion on deposit and the FDIC fund has how much in there? Uh, about 27 billion. Okay, when we look at situations like what we saw recently in Cyprus where they had a bail-in, uh, here you have a situation where deposits uh, from bank, from people with money at the bank was basically confiscated by the government. Right. And so when you describe a situation where the FDIC has a minuscule amount of funds available in case of a some kind of meltdown in the financial system, which is almost 100% guaranteed to happen in a relatively soon basis, are we saying, therefore, the U.S. would be a prime candidate for a bail-in type situation? Right, because according to Dodd-Frank, we're not allowed to have taxpayers bail out the banks. So when they go bankrupt, what are they going to do? They're not treated with the same rules that a bus normal business has where when a bank goes bankrupt, assets are dispersed. They get to seize deposits and turn depositors into shareholders and then, and then continue business. Okay, so there's another, another big point here which you cover over there at uh, publicbanking.org along with Alan Brown, who's a big, a big fan of our, uh, uh, friend, I should say, of our show. Does a depositor own his or her deposit? No, they don't. So explain that exactly. If I give the money to HSBC or Citibank or some big bank and I put my money in the bank, don't I own that money? No, you become a creditor of that bank. The, the money is owned by the bank and that they treat that as a li liability. They owe that money back to you. Has this always been the case? Yes. And is there anyone out there trying to reform this other than you? Uh, because you have the obvious conflict of interest if 
if things go bad, the bank simply says, well, these are our deposits to begin with, and you got to get in line, and you got to get in line behind a massive number of creditors. Right. Well, I think 2008 was a big wake-up call for, for the general public in, in America and elsewhere, and, and people are realizing that the, the banking system uh, has all sorts of fraud b baked into it, and we've been told one thing, but the reality is another. So there's fraud baked into the system. It seems as though the fraud recipe is being shared amongst various banks and institutions, and you have a plague of fraud. To me, I'm curious what your comment is here. Back in the 80s, you had the savings and loan crisis. And what happened was that banks were extending certificates of deposits to folks knowing that they couldn't possibly repay those certificates of deposit because and knowing that when they were unable, the federal government would have to come in and make good on that claim, so they were gaming the system. In the wake of that scandal, instead of the government or somebody a regula coming in and imposing regulations that would prevent that from happening, it seems as though the banking lobbyists in America figured out exactly how to lobby to change the law and to create new laws. So when they did the exact same thing again, they would not go to jail as over a thousand did last time. Is that an unfair characterization? No, that's, that's absolutely fair. And, and, and the thing what's happened is, is that even regular law, like bankruptcy law, is they're treated special. So, so when, they, when a bank goes bankrupt, they get to seize depositors' funds and turn that into capital. And, and no other business has the right to do that, but banks do. All right, let's talk about the $700 trillion in derivatives, outstanding. Uh, in the event of bankruptcy proceeding, who has priority, the depositor or the derivatives wielder? I guess we've already kind of answered yeah, der that. derivative claimants, yes. And the $700 trillion, you mentioned that there are a trillion in deposits uh, backed by minuscule amounts of insurance at the FDIC. $700 trillion in derivatives, of course, is against a global economy with only approximately $60 trillion in GDP. So those, is it unfair to say that when Hank Paulson goes to Congress and says, give us a, 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 a trillion dollars for TARP, uh, that he's being extortionate and he's wielding the weapon of, we'll collapse the system using derivatives unless you give us our cash. Is that an unfair characterization? No, not at all. Let's talk about what your group does. Uh, how would a public bank and of course, I'm talking with Mark Armstrong of publicbanking.org. How would a public bank address the problem with this model? So the premise behind the Public Banking Institute, of which I'm a part, Ellen Brown founded it along with an, a dozen or so other people, uh, is, is that all, virtually all of public finance has been co-opted by private financiers. So, so there's no true public finance in the U.S. anymore. Uh, in virtually all, 49 of the 50 states, public dollars, tax receipts, fees, are deposited into private banks, and that begins a set of dependencies so that public officials are wholly dependent upon the private financing world. And public banking is all about putting those deposits, and it's over a trillion dollars of deposits, into public banks, government-owned banks, which are then used the, the, the capacity to create credit to fund bridges, to fund schools, to fund things that can be paid back and that we need. It seems that the banking industry is remarkably simple. When I was working on Wall Street, there was the old 363 rule, which is uh, you, you pay out uh, 3% uh, you, and you lend at 6% and you're on the golf course by 3. But there's an amazing sim simplicity to this model of banking that you could say it's almost a utility, that it, 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 the, the utility industry makes sure people get power. To, 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 to power up the, the economy, to power right. their homes, has been regulated for years because you don't want private enterprises gouging the price of, uh, of energy right. because it's completely malevolent to the entire economy. Banking, similarly, it's a very simple business. Uh, it's a utility, and yet not, none of those utility banks exist anymore. They've all been purchased by these super infrastructure mega banks. Right. It's all been privatized. They are leveraged 50 to 60 to 1. So what you're saying on the surface to those who forget the history of banking will say, wow, that sounds like you're turning your back on free markets, you're turning your back on capitalism, you're returning to some kind of um, government interference. But that's completely false. You're just returning banks to where, from once they came. It's right. a simple business. Doing a simple activity, it should be simply organized. We look at water, we look at electricity, transportation, mail, all those are utilities. And, and the creation of money is definitely a utility. Of all those utilities, it's probably the most important. And, and we look at each one of those 
markets uh, as, a, as a place where you want to regulate industry and you also want to provide a public service. So you have water coming out of the tap, you have le electricity coming uh, over the wires, uh, you have mail delivery service, at least we used to, it's being privatized here as well as in the states. And, and so when you look at public finance, it's been completely privatized where, where uh, public finance officials need to go to the private market to obtain low, relatively low cost funds. But you know, even you know, there, in California, there have been capital appreciation bonds being sold over the last seven years. Nine billion dollars of principles has been financed and the cost on that's gonna be 27 billion in, in interest. So we're being gouged in the public finance world and public banking is just an alternative to, to finance that ourselves without going to the private markets. What, what I don't understand about Americans, if I can use the term you know, broadly in this sense, but they seem to uh, like and understand how Walmart uses its size to pressure suppliers to get cheap stuff. But they don't seem to get that the size of the government can be used to pressure suppliers to deliver cheap banking, cheap health care, right, right. cheap transportation. In other words, the biggest beneficiary of having the government act as a, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, to negotiate good prices in a Walmart-like fashion are the people. The people would benefit from this. Right. And yet they're the ones, the first ones to step up and say, no, no, we don't want cheap prices. We want to pay through the nose. We want to be gouged. We want to be <laughs> raped. Why is that? You know, the whole notion behind banking is that it's, it's, it's really, it is a simple business, as you're saying, and, and what, what gives the bankers the right to, to um, extend credit is the banking license, which is issued by the state government, typically. And, and yet, state governments disenfranchise themselves from having that, own, that same license to have a seat at the table to access low-cost funds. Which is, which is what is needed in order to better finance schools or bridges, whatever. The Bay Bridge just reopened up. It's a beautiful bridge. I, I just went on it for the first time two days ago, but it, is, uh, it costs $6.4 billion in, in materials and services. It's another $6 billion in interest charges. But we held labor under the microscope uh, while, while it was being built. We never looked at the financing for it and yet it doubles the cost. Yeah, this is again, as we touched upon, uh, as we do on this show often, is that GDP is calculated by taking into account all of the misinvestments that are made by the investment community and the interest costs that they pile on to right. all of these projects. However, when it looks at inflation numbers and why that should be adjusted to labor, then of course everything is deflating in value. Right. So if you're working for a living, it's always about deflation and Ben Bernanke needs to keep interest rates low to help you. But if you're a banker, GDP is great and I need to pay myself an enormous bonus. Right. Tight, yeah. Now, exactly. uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, you touched on this briefly. I want to get into it a little bit more. Um, give us a sense of how the public bank would look like, for example, how would it reduce debt servicing costs? Okay, you're getting into this now, and I want you to probe a little bit deeper because the interest cost in this economy is the killer. It's, it's ratcheting it up in ways that if interest rates were ever to resume a normal uh, rate of 5%, which is the post-war normal rate of a 10-year bond would be 5%, right. not half a percent. So if we ever return to a normalized interest rate curve, then interest costs would go up 500% or more. And, it, and no one seems to be protecting the public against this. They're just adding more right, and more right. debt to fill the pockets of Goldman, JP Morgan, HSBC, and Barclays. So uh, talk a little bit about, I think, sure. yeah. Uh, so, so I'll just use an example. Bank of North Dakota is a public bank. It's the only public bank in the United States, and it does financing for infrastructure. So it financed a water pipeline in the western part of North Dakota. They, it put in $50 million to fund that. And let's just think about the mechanics of that. What's happening is the, rate, the water payers are paying for the interest on that. It doesn't really matter what the interest is because whatever interest they pay goes back to the bank, which is owned by the people, and then that, that money is recognized as profits and returned to the general budget to lower taxes or to provide increased services. So, so you end up with this closed circuit. So it doesn't matter what the, what the interest rate is, frankly, in a, in a closed circuit like that, because the people may pay the interest, but they're going to receive it back in terms of profits. So that's the, note, that's the, that's the value proposition behind a public bank, is, is that it returns the interest to the same economy in which it was paid. During the financial crisis, the North Dakota bank, what happened? 
Uh, their return on equity was 25% that year, 2008. So they, they, not, they didn't go down, they thrived. They thrived, and their return on assets was approaching 2%. Two, 2%. So, yeah, they, they, did, they did great. So here I have a model. What's, what's, what's interesting about public banks is they're counter-cyclical. Counter so some of our material comes out of Latin America, and there, there are a lot of public banks in South America, and, they, and they've got done studies, and one of the most recent studies showed that all their banks actually grew during the recession. Same with Bank of North Dakota. So they're actually doing what you'd expect in any healthy, balanced economy or ecology is that when one area goes down, another area makes up the cost. Exactly. Yeah. What, what we have now is that when, since all these banks are trading on the exact same thing at the exact same time with the exact same leverage, yeah. when it starts to blow up, they all blow up. Right. And then they it's have a systemic failure. But, but public banks are, are, are really a, a hedge against that. All right, fantastic. Mark Armstrong of publicbanking.org. We're out of time. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Cool. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Mark Armstrong of publicbanking.org. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.